Hello and welcome to this week's feature-length episode of A Mic on the Podium with me, Michael Seal. Before we start, I want to thank my latest Patreon subscribers, David and Jenny, for their support as well as all my other Patreon subscribers. If you would like to support the podcast financially and gain access to exclusive companion mini-episodes, articles, group Zoom meetings, or two brand new series of interviews, head over to patreon.com forward slash a mic on the podium, where you will find six different levels of subscription, the cheapest being the price of a glass of wine once a month. Alternatively, go to justgiving.com, search for a mic on the podium, and make a one-off donation there. Details are in the show notes below. Today, I conduct a conversation with a French conductor whose career has been truly international, having studied in the US and the UK, as well as having title positions in the UK, US, Belgium, China and France. It's a great pleasure to welcome Ludovic Morlo. Ludo, lovely to talk to you today. How are you? I'm doing very well, thanks Mike. Thanks for having me. Not a problem at all. Um, As I'm sure you know, uh, at the beginning of the podcast, I like to go right back and find out how music first came into your life, whether you were from a musical family, whether it came as a bolt from the blue, um, what happened in your life early doors that meant music came into it? Well, you know, my story as I I started with music is not very exciting, I have to say, (laughs) because there was no music in my family, in my direct family, I have to say. You know, my... My parents were much more uh, in love with words than music, okay. if, I, if, if I try to summarize it. And, you know, my, my father was a, a school teacher. Uh, and I, I remember growing up with listening to a lot of radio, but more like the BBC Four mm. French equivalent to BBC Four than the BBC Three, yeah. you know. And the, so, uh, Radio Four. So, so there, was, there was a lot of news. Uh, at the t- uh, even at the dinner table, I remember listening to the radio a lot, but there was very little music actually, mm-hmm. and not only classical music, music period. Uh, I remember it would be it would be quite exceptional when my dad would put on uh, LP at the time, you know, and and it would would be always the same thing. The his favorite, like I can't tell you how many times I listened to Packable's Canon. <laughs> <You know>? <laughs> <laughs> so so I was. Uh, harmonically, you know, when I jumped into studying music, I was really ready with the, the cycle of fifths. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but um, my mom, I think my mom was more in love with um, the voice. So occasionally we, we would listen to opera a little bit, um, but it really came from her parents. And actually my, my dad's father also played an instrument that he had learned during the war. So my my grandfather's, were much more musical than my parents. Mm. Um, and I think the beginning for me was that my mother was in some ways frustrated not to have had this opportunity in her life to learn an instrument, to learn playing music. And she wanted for, for all of us with my siblings to have that chance as very young uh, children. So pretty much one day it was like, um, you know, it was not a, a, like Christmas, but it was like deciding, oh, you know, you can pick any instrument that you'd like to learn to play. Hmm. And uh, my, 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 my older sister picked the piano because there was a really, really old piano in the house. I'm not even sure where it came from, but it was falling apart, really. Okay. Um, my brother picked the flute. I picked the violin and my, older, uh, my younger sister picked the piano as well. I picked the violin when I was six because uh, my grandfather on my side, on my father's side, had learned to play the violin during the war. Mm. He was a he was a prisoner during the war just for a year or so, and and self taught himself to to play the clarinet and the violin. And as a little boy, I would spend all my my summers with my grandfather in south of France and. And I think that's where my love for violin actually started. And um, so I, you know, they, they registered me in the music conservatoire and then I, I started violin lesson from age six and I guess developed a, a very early love for it, even though we never really loved the practice and all those things, but oh, there no. was something about, <laughs> <laughs> but there was something about playing, um, I mean, making music, making a sound that, that was really visceral and, 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 infectious right away and they so i'm 
quickly quickly on I, I i felt a real connection to to the instrument and and then you know i i also was a normal boy you know i played a lot of uh, football i played a lot i i, I love sport as well so um a, a lot was, of conductors seem to like sports as well uh, even you know going on later into life um one of the last people i interviewed we we agreed that um yeah, there must be some correlation between sport. I wanted to go back. You mentioned Packerwell's Canon. I wonder whether, you know, hearing that piece over and over again, you know, the violin has such a starring role in that piece. Uh, whereas, as we know, the cello has the most dullest of music to play over and over again. I mean, there sure, are en sure. endless YouTube videos about how dull the cello part of Packerwell's Canon is. I wonder whether that, uh, uh, obviously, you're with your grandfather also playing the violin, that would have been a big influence. But I, I do wonder whether you would have heard the, you know, the three-part inventions of Packerbos Cannon on the violin, whether that also embedded in there as well. Maybe, yeah. yeah. I, it, un unconsciously, that might have been happening. Yes. Um, but yeah, music, so that's how I started with music, violin, and then early on, actually, it has to do with a little bit of uh, what happened in my life because my parents moved out of uh, the, the city of Lyon, where I was growing up, mm. and not very far away, but just far enough that I, if I wanted to pursue my uh, studies with, with music, I would have to live uh, with my grandfather. And now it's the other grandfather. So my, mm. on my mother's side, who was an amateur of everything. He loved photography, uh, music. He was singing in an amateur chorus. Um, he was painting. He was a. Uh, he loves. He loved history. I mean, he was a really passionate character mm. about everything in life. And I was age twelve by then when I lived with him, uh, in and not with my parents. Um, and I think that was transformational for me when it came to my love for music because he was the first one to take me to a concert, to take me to a live opera performance. Um, and you know we played those games when when I came back from school. I remember I would he, he would make me sit in the living room and and is that name that tune the game you played? You know, yeah, yeah. He yeah. would he would play little bits of the operas here and there, and I just had to guess, you know, first the composer and then and then the opera and then eventually the singers, even the orchestras, the conductor. So it it became really something. Um, that I, I, I became very uh, familiar with, but also very much in love with that ritual of listening to music, which was very new to me at the time. It's still a game I play now if I'm driving in the car and I've got, uh, you know, as you say, BBC Radio 4 or Talk Sport or something on the radio, I think I'll switch to BBC Radio 3 and let's see if I can, first of all, spot the composer. Then, if, of course, if I know the piece, then immediately I'm thinking, right, which orchestra? And then which conductor? And yes, yeah, a game I play regularly. And, um, and what a thing to be doing when you're 12 and upwards. Uh, what a great way of learning to listen, isn't it, really? Learning to listen Very hard. Much so. Yeah. Very much so, because the only way I could recognize those things was by memory. Hmm. Actually, it was very important because I realized early on that that memory and repetition, you know, brought a lot of familiarity with everything. And something that I still remember today when I do programming and or how to invite people into a new music or people uh, invite people to actually appreciate something that is not as familiar is, is to to go back to that time where I remember that I started loving things more and more because I I became more and more familiar with it. Mm, mm. Well, that's great. Um, I'm assuming as you're now growing up, um, living in Lyon with your grandfather and, and learning the violin, that at some point you were now joining either a school orchestra or a youth orchestra and would have seen or, or would have been conducted by somebody for the first time. Obviously, you said you've been to opera and you've been to concert performances. When did conducting first um, come into your life and did it come in in any important way or was it just there for a while and, you know, uh, you you accepted it for what it was? Oh, conducting came much, much, much later yeah. in my life. Uh, violin was was everything really. I, I was studying at the conservatoire in Lyon, so music conservatory, which means that I was playing chamber music, orchestra, a lot of orchestra, in fact. I remember my uh, touring, you know, with with the orchestra of the conservatory. And then soon I was I was playing with the French National Orchestra, with the 
you know, different uh, youth orchestras in the region as well. Mm. So my introduction to conducting or the, the world of, of orchestra music was really through the violin and through falling in love with this repertoire, really. Yeah. Um, I remember I was a member also of the, this, this youth orchestra that was led by and conducted by Tibor Varga, who, mm. whom I know you're very familiar with, a fantastic violinist, who I also benefited from uh, studying with in, in, in the violin performance as well. Um, so he was a great influence on, on orchestra and loving, loving to play together. And my love, I think my love for, for conducting came out of that discipline of playing to, you know, together with an orchestra or, or chamber music. Mm. That really is where much later in my 20s, I, I had this opportunity to, to actually step on the podium for the first time at the Pierre Monte School in Maine, in, mm. in the USA. Um, so I, I was actually studying violin performance at the University of Montreal in Canada at the time with Vladimir Lanzmann, and uh, I was quite serious about violin. And then they had this summer school uh, program for orchestra playing and conductors in Maine at the Pierre Monte School, which I actually first attended as a violinist to enhance my knowledge about orchestra repertoire. Yeah. And you would go and it would be a, a very beautiful studio in the middle of Maine, you know, by the sea, by the ocean. And you would have a first violin section of six, you know, it was really <laughs> tiny. Yeah. But we would play, we would play 60 pieces of repertoire every summer over My six God. weeks. That's amazing. It was, yeah. yeah, it was huge. And it was a, a wonderful way to learn the repertoire. And I would sit concert master one day, one week at the back of the second violins another week. Mm. And then if, if for some reasons, you know, you needed someone to play an extra percussion, you would, you would be called <laughs> into that section too. And, and you would do work on the library as well and, and, and all, all different aspects of orchestral life, really. And then uh, Charles Brook, who was a wonderful conductor also, he, another Hungarian. I mean, Hungarians have had a, a lot of influence in my early life. Um, with Tibor Varga and, and Charles Brook. Charles Brook was a, an assistant to Pierre Monteux for many years at the, at the Radio Orchestra in Paris and was teaching, conducting at that Pierre Monteux school at the time. And he invited me on the podium one day and said, I don't know why, you know, I never really got a chance to ask him why made him want me to try to conduct. But mm. I guess I was sitting in concert master position enough that he could he could see some kind of leadership and um, I mean, joy of really making music uh, with orchestra, with colleagues. So he invited me on the podium and, I, and that's how, I, how it all started really in a, in, in a summer program when I was about, I would say early 20s. Yeah, early mm. 20s. And it was not really in my mind until that day where I was invited to conduct at the Pierre Monte School. So that day, I'm interested to know, do, do you remember that vividly or was it the start of almost like a, an infection, a disease? Um, was that the day you caught the disease of conducting? You know, I, I can't think of a better word than disease, but it, you know, it's obviously in my mind because of what we're, where, we're, yeah. where we're at the moment. Or, you know, I know other people who've, who've stood on the podium conducted that and they can remember everything about that first experience. What was it like for you? Oh no, I, I do remember it very fondly. For me, it was like falling in love. It's mm. like, I lost my head. I lost everything. I didn't know where I was, what I was doing. It was like being isolated in that bubble, uh, uh, which you never really want to live really. Um, yeah. So I was not conscious about really what was happening to me, but I, it was the emotion involved was so strong that I think, yeah, it was, it was really like, like, completely falling in love with the music again on a completely different level. Um, it was, I remember the piece, it was Bartok, Hungarian sketches, you know, those very, yeah. very short uh, sketches, beautiful, very difficult to conduct. And uh, Charles Brook was really amazing because he taught me my first lesson with my hands in my pocket. <laughs> so 
I had to conduct this music full of rubatos with zero experience, with being completely overwhelmed by by stepping on that podium with no hands. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> so, so I think suddenly he wanted to kind of make, make me aware right away that music was just about communicating, mm. you know, with your eyes, with your burning heart and with everything else, but, but, but the obvious. Mm. And um, this was maybe possibly the strongest start for me because then he had me conduct the opening of Beethoven fifth the next week, you know, in, with, in the same manner. And I have very, very fond musical mem memories about those lessons. The, I remember that same summer, um, he had me conduct American in Paris, Gershwin, and um, I couldn't swing, of course, because I was frozen out there. So <laughs> he, I remember he, he, he asked the, the first stands of the string players to actually make a little space, clear the space in front of the podium. And he asked me to invite who I thought was the most beautiful a uh, girl in the orchestra <laughs> to to actually dance to the orchestra playing American in Paris in front of everybody, and uh, and it was not a pretty sight, believe me, because I'm not a dancer. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, this always put put me in situations like this. You know, conduct without your hands, uh, pick pick a beautiful girl in the orchestra and start dancing in front of the orchestra. Some things that I think you know. I was a very uh, shy, reserved uh, young young man, and I think that that kind of helped me tremendously to understand what was needed yes. to actually be conducting in my life. If that's something I would pursue, you're right in the fact that um, you know you can be shy, socially shy, but you can't be if you're stood on the podium. You have to learn to be more outgoing, or you know you have to learn to be able to communicate and. Um, what a brilliant method of doing that. I wonder whether I can sneak that into some lessons at Conservatory <laughs> in Birmingham. Um, <laughs> yeah, warning conducting students, it's time to dance. Um, <laughs> oh, I've, I've, I've done it I've done it once in a while, you know, when I do masterclass here and there, yeah. to have at least people experience that feeling to to start a piece without without your hands, because yeah. as, we, as we know, it's all about preparation, breath, and, you know, how you invite people into the sound, and, and that, that maybe is the most uh, direct way to actually experience this. You, know? mm. you also said something else, which I'm going to pick up on, um, which was brilliant, in the fact that conducting made you fall in love with the music again. Uh, it, I think you said in a different way. And I couldn't agree more. I mean, you know, as I'm sure you know, I played in the city of Birmingham Symphony for 22 years as a professional. And there is nothing mm -hmm. like playing in, in an orchestra like that good in the middle of an incredible performance. There is nothing like that. Um, and, you know, I wouldn't swap a single second of doing that. Um, but when you stand up and conduct, it is a completely different thing. And, and the music affects you in a different way. It's the same notes, it's the same dots and lines, it's, it, but it is different, isn't it? Um, I can't put my finger on what, what it is, but it is different. I think it's about curiosity. Mm. I feel that as a player, a lot of things I took for granted or I didn't really question, you know? Yeah. Uh, and then suddenly, actually, my playing changed from that day because I was still studying violin. And then suddenly, I was so much more curious about what I was trying to do with the instrument. So I think the the conducting, when I said I fell in love with the music again, meant I I kind of added so many layers at once. Mm. It was it was suddenly I became so much more curious and involved into why I would make those decisions and. Um, and, and of course, music becomes so much more interesting at that level. Mm. So you then take this newfound love of conducting and come to the UK. Um, is that right? Is that the next thing you did was come to the Royal Academy? And then you're studying with, and these three names have cropped up quite a lot on the podcast already. Colin Metters, okay. George Hurst, and, and Colin Davis, of course, was coming in and doing masterclasses and things. Uh, so how was your time at the Academy? Did you enjoy it? Uh, and by then, had the violin disappeared completely or was it still part of your life? Well, I love my time in London. I mean, you know, I was actually after uh, uh, four years, was that three years abroad? I was ready to come back home uh, to Europe, actually, at the, at the time. And I felt really that this would be my next step, would be 
to come back to Europe. And, and London had this wonderful opportunity for me to audition for the Academy conducting program from a master degree and I graduate degree. So I just felt, let's, let's go for it. Having not much expectation about it, quite frankly, because I had, I had very little experience with conducting, but for some reasons I got into the program and uh, those years I, I, we are just fabulous. I mean, mm. not only being uh, in the in the environment of the academy, but also to be in London and such a musical city, and discovering that I I had I could do all those things that I have haven't really had a chance to do, which were going out to rehearsals, listening to orchestras, those wonderful libraries here and there, you know, be able to have all this material at hand uh, to then explore my new passion which mm. it really felt like a new thing for me. And I was in my twenties, but it felt like, oh, this is actually what music was meant to, to bring to my life, you know? Mm. Um, so the program was outstanding in the sense that it taught me a lot of discipline, you know? It taught me, a, because <laughs> I had used my hands eventually at the Piamonte school, but very <laughs> little <laughs> uh, to conduct, but, but, but I think the, the, the discipline and the format of the, the classes at the academy really brought a lot of discipline to my, to, to my understanding of, of how to use my, my hands to conduct. Yeah. Um, so, some, it was a very strongly um, focused program on, on technique, I would say, yes. yeah. which at the time was really fabulous for me because that's what I needed. You know, we we did draw a lot of figures of eight for, <laughs> for three years, but every direction you can think. But made made me also aware of this continuity in the in the in the sound and the music, and it, that everything is about space, uh, speed traveling from one point to another mm. is what eventually is going to create the sound that you're after, and the sense of preparation and breath again mm. that is so fundamental to yeah. to making music. It's interesting you 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 talk about that you know I, I often say to my students it's not about the beat it's about the journey between the beat that's the interesting thing to musicians they want to see that journey they want to see the speed of the journey you know how, whether it's a smooth journey or not and and uh, yeah that's a technical aspect that I think is so important well for sure because I mean the minute the beat is there it's too late right I mean yeah. it's like if once your foot is on the floor, you 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 can't do anything about it uh, apart from thinking about the next step, right? Yeah, exactly. And, um, so so those years made me realize all of those things. Um, I w I wish maybe we would have had a little bit more chance to go deep deeper into some of the repertoire, you know, during that time, because it was very focused on on the next podium time opportunity we had when it came to repertoire. Oh. Um, so. But but thankfully, being in London, I, I could go and listen to rehearsals, concerts every day and really get my knowledge of the orchestra repertoire through those mediums. So it, it was kind of an ideal scenario where I could combine those two activities. And violin, to answer your questions, violin was start, starting to take a little different role, actually. I was still playing, but it, it was now more for my love of chamber music and maybe starting to explore more how I could use the violin studying conducting. So mm. a lot of, a lot of kind of creating my own bowings and things like that. And uh, which is to this day, very, still very important to me. Um, but yeah, I was, I was still playing somewhat. Uh, I remember playing in ensembles here and there, which is something uh, little by little kind of started decreasing. Mm. It's, it, I, I still have a violin on my desk. Um, and I often, you know, when I'm learning scores, I'll pick it up and try a bowing out or try something out. And uh, yeah, I, d I don't think you could ever go away completely. Um, yeah, it's, I, it's always there. It's always yeah. there with me too, but I'm, I, I, bet, I bet it doesn't sound anything like your play. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I retired six years ago, Ludo, and I can, my playing has yeah. rapidly well, deteriorated. <laughs> um, <laughs> still, it is painful for me to take the violin, but I... I you know, I hide with it, but I thoroughly enjoy making a sound some, once in a while. Um, so we finish in London. Um, I think your next step is 
um you're out in the big wide world and you're guest conducting but the the next thing is you get you you get a job back home um conductor in residence with the orchestra national de leon is that right actually i'm not completely done in in london quite yet mm. because i did uh, i i had a fellowship one year at the royal college as well yeah uh, right followed my following my my years at the academy with uh, colin davis was running an opera program at the royal college yeah and uh and so I, I, I had a chance to really then explore my, my love for opera uh, by being uh, the Norman Delmar Fellow at the Royal College for one year. Yeah. And I, what that meant is really I was attached to the opera program and I, I did a lot of preparation for Colin Davis on uh, Don Giovanni. I remember Midsummer Night's Dream written and, um, and really kind of started tasting the opera world and the differences between, you know, coming from such a heavy background of orchestra playing to something very new again. And then I moved to, before I had this, this uh, job back to France with the Orchestre National, I applied to Tanglewood, um, the Boston Symphony. I mean, everybody knows Tanglewood that is listening to your podcast, I suspect, but the Boston Symphony uh, summer home. And uh, there was 2001 and, and I was uh, auditioning for Seiji Ozawa at the time and got invited to take part in the summer festival of, of Tanglewood in 2001. So there, that was actually a very in, important step for me because it happened just before David Robertson offered me the position in Lyon with the Orchestre National as a conductor in residence. Mm. Uh, so what, what I'm saying this because then I spent the next following years, not only in France, but living between Boston and France because I kept, after my summer at Tanglewood, I kept being invited uh, to, to the Boston Symphony as a cover conductor. Ah, right, okay. Um, well, I, I, I did wonder how Leon came about, and that, you've made that very clear. Tanglewood is something that, yeah, it's been mentioned in previous episodes, but uh, I think Daniel Hardy mentioned going there, actually. Um, what were those summers like? I would imagine very intense that you're, you're in this conducting class with Soji Ozawa, and and having been taught by Colin Davis and Colin Metters and George Hurst and uh, and um, also at the Monteur School, what was Azawa's style like as a teacher? Yeah, it was an incredible summer, very intense indeed. You know, it was the time where actually the auditions for Tanglewood were still live auditions in Boston. Hmm. I want to go go back a little bit to that because that was already an incredible gift, which was the first time I conducted. The Boston Symphony Orchestra for those auditions, incredible, mm. Mm. with uh, with with you know Ozawa sitting next 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 to you really. Mm. So when he invited me to that summer of Tanglewood 2001, what was very special for me was that it was his last summer teaching there as music director of the Boston Symphony because that was his last season there, mm. and very important as well is that i was the only fellow that year oh wow yeah it was a very unique situation where i had incredible access and time with not only seiji but with also uh, robert spano and all the guest conductors and they still had the uh, opera program at tanglewood back then so i remember seiji conducting a double bill of the ravel operas and I was very involved with preparing that too. So it was incredibly busy, as you could imagine. Uh, I had master class with André Prévin, uh, uh, André Prévin, I should say. And then, uh, every, you know, every conductor coming to conduct the BSO would give a master class. And I was, I was the, the only beneficiary for that for 88 weeks. So that's amazing. Yeah, it was, it was quite very, very, very special time. And I think that's what, why I was feeling so lucky to to create very strong bonds with with Seiji Ozawa at the time, and right away he invited me to to uh, cover some weeks for for him at the Boston Symphony, even though um, he was not really music director anymore. But what happened is that for three years, as you know, they didn't have music directors, so no. Seiji would still come back and do a little bit of work there. So a lot of time spent traveling between Lyon and Boston uh, in those early days. And I'm assuming also guest conducting. 
and maybe on one of those first dates as a guest conductor was where you first met the Seattle Symphony Orchestra, I would imagine. Is that true? I mean, how, what was it like those early days guesting, first dates? No, yeah, I, I wasn't actually guest conducting yet quite quite uh, very much because you yeah. know I was with my my role in Lyon was about working with the youth orchestras really yeah. so I would do little things but guest conducting didn't really start bef- before I became officially assistant to the Boston Symphony in 2004 for for James Levine yeah. and uh, so I, I had those three three years in between Tanglewood and and when I became officially assistant to the BSO to kind of develop um, this routine of be, be, being, you know, assistant conductors on projects, but it didn't. It did, the guest conducting didn't really kick in before I really started being an assistant in Boston. Yeah. But it, but it started really, really quickly and at a very high level. That's yeah. during that time I was, I was, uh, I had this kind of break, you know, to go and conduct the New York Philharmonic. Uh, I was 24 hour notice because wow. Christophe von Dornani <laughs> fell sick. Mm. And so I, in a way I was baptized by fire, right? <laughs> mm. <laughs> I, I didn't really have many years to build uh, a, a, a confidence in, into going to guest orchestra and, and uh, guest combat. But my experience from working with youth orchestras kind of became suddenly exponential and over, almost overnight, you know, uh, having to step on the big stage with big orchestras, which mm. in a way I'm grateful for because it, it is easier to conduct the New York Phil with 24 hour notice than doing any any kind of guest conducting with a, a lesser known orchestra in a way, because, you know, they'll, they'll do it for you. Yes. Uh, um, and, and because of the situation, they're not likely to eat you alive they're, they're very grateful that somebody's come in at 24 hours notice and they'll work with you in that situation um yes you know that very and, much so. and therefore you you get all of the benefits of learning what it's like to conduct the new york philharmonic without all of the stress of maybe you know nine months or 12 months run up to that first gig you know with you thinking of oh, what's it going to be like what they're going to be like with me how's it going to be they've seen your name on the schedule nine to 12 months in advance and go oh who's this guy none of that is there you just walk Very in you conduct so. and do it and, and you get all of the benefit from it at least in the short term yeah i mean that is part of the difficulty of guest conducting isn't it is that you know you can build things up in your mind and think well i wonder what that they're going to be like and i've heard some stories about this orchestra and other stories about that orchestra and yeah it's uh it's a funny business isn't it very much so and and during that time so you know little by little i got invited many many different places i mean i would say too many too many places it became uh, somewhat overwhelming you know in terms of mm-hmm. uh, I was lucky with repertoire because those years spent in Boston as assistant, I built a lot of repertoire. So at least that was that was something I, I could really use um, as a guest conductor. But I started traveling the world a lot, and um, and one of the weeks indeed was in Seattle in mm. 2009, I would say. So uh, right after my the end of my tenure in uh, in Boston, almost. Mm. Well, <clears throat> before we get to Seattle, I know I mentioned it a while ago, but we're, we're jumping about because you keep saying interesting things, and that's why I'm jumping about. <laughs> um, uh, your job in, in Boston, because you mentioned James Levine, who um, nobody's talked about on this podcast yet, um, and I'm always intrigued to know this. Were you assistant to the orchestra or were you assistant to James Levine? Because often if you're the assistant to the orchestra, you have some contact with the principal conductor or the music director. But if you're assistant to James Levine obviously you're there all of the time for everything that he does how did it work yeah uh, there were two assistants so we would share the the the, the schedule you know we would assist uh, James Levine's weeks but also every guest conductor mm. that would come to the Boston Symphony we, w- we would share so we were both uh, assistants to, to 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 Levine but also to the orchestra um, so it was it was it was a full time job, you know. I was I was there. I was living in Boston actually then during those three years. Those years were phenomenal because also Levine was also doing a lot at the Met still, and I would go and spend a lot of time in New York, mm-hmm. observing rehearsals at the Met. So that Boston New York combination was ideal 
to be a little bit like the one I had in London <laughs> in, in my student days. I had this incredible environment of, you know, going from the, the Met rehearsal to Carnegie Hall concerts with the Met Orchestra to sitting at the, the, in this wonderful hall, you know, Symphony Hall uh, in Boston, and then, and, and then being part of those families, you know, I mean, mm. also what was incredible as assistant to the Boston Symphony, which is a little different than other US orchestras maybe, is that they actually gave you a subscription week every, every season to conduct the orchestra. Oh, wonderful. So I made my debut in subscription with BSO when I was a kid, really. Um, mm. and, and then the following season, you would have a week at the Tanglewood Festival. And then the year after, you would go back to have a subscription week downtown in Boston. It was, it was phenomenal. And, um, and the, the repertoire that, that was programmed then was incredible. I mean, I remember just as a highlight, you know, Levine doing a, a big Beethoven Schoenberg cycle during my time where I had to be ready to step in for uh, uh, Moses and Aaron for one week. <laughs> and the following, following week was Misa Solemnis. And, <laughs> And then the following week was, um, you know, Fidelio, and it was incredible. Wow. And and the wealth of repertoire that I I was able to to learn, and to learn with with this great musician. You know, I mean, I mean, Jimmy would be sometimes very very uh, uh, much available for questions and and you know talking about the music, and sometimes it would be impossible to get to him for three months. You know, hmm. so but I I remember feeling that that really incredible privilege to hear him play the piano and, you know, and talk through Moses and Aaron. When, when you're in your late 20s, you know, that's a gift. Mm. Uh, uh, given my background, all this music was new and, and to experience it at this level right away. And, and, and bear in mind, you know, the, the guest conductors at the time at the Boston Symphony, which I, I would cover for, became my mentors. I mean, that's where I met Bernard Heiting, that's where I met Fulbeck de Burgos. That's where I met uh, Andre Previn. Uh, I mean, Neville Mariner. I mean, everybody <laughs> would, Colin Davis would still come once in a while. I mean, you know, you, you had this wealth of, of uh, musicians coming, coming through uh, and, and you, could, you could really have this really wonderful intimate uh, mentorship from, from them. I, I met many composers there too. You know, I would sit, one week I would sit next to Henri Dutilleux there because they would premiere his, his piece Shadows of Time. Um, the next week I would sit with uh, Milton Babbitt, you know, or <laughs> Elliot Carter. And I mean, they, this was a phenomenal time and, and something that I, I still cherish to this day very much. Well, the other thing that I, personally, I mean, I'm jealous of, I mean, not just the, the, you know, the composers and conductors you were shadowing and working with, but the ability as somebody like myself, and I think you were saying that, you know, who's come from an orchestral symphonic background, the ability to immerse yourself in how an opera is built and rehearsed through going, first of all, with Colin Davis at the Royal College, but then with uh, Levine and the Met, what a wonderful way into the opera world, because that's still something, you know, for me, I've done a couple of operas, but it's still something that, you know, I don't understand as well as the symphonic world. And what a brilliant educational experience that must have been to have you know, sat on the shoulders of people as good as that and watched how they put an opera together from the start, um, which, you know, put you in good stead later on, you know, in your career, obviously, uh, which we'll come to. But yeah, what a, what a privilege that is. It was wonderful. And, and I think also what I learned from all those different conductors was very, very specific things and very different things. Uh, you know, just to name a few, what I learned most from... Levine, for instance, was time management, rehearsal mm -hmm. technique. He was, he, he was a master of those things. You know, he, he could rehearse 10 measures of, of Valkyrie with the most detailed attention. And then the whole opera would, would be transformed as a, as, a, as a consequence of working those 10 measures in so much depth and details. Mm -hmm. um, from, from Heiting, for instance, I learned this incredible a gift he has to to create a, a warmth and richness of sound but also natural breath to the sound that musicians in the orchestras feel so comfortable with you know mm, mm. um uh, from from ozawa i learned an incredible focus on rhythm and on 
how you work your relationships, your tempo relationships, and how you work um, on, on, you know, t- technique was very important for Seiji, as we know. And, and he, he always kind of found his way of understanding music through the, th- through the pattern of, of rhythm more than anything. And so they all had this kind of different focuses that we are so different from one another that ob- obviously and hopefully as a, as a young artist, I could, I could find my voice, my own voice, by being influenced by so many different voices. Mm. I find, I was lucky in a way not to be, uh, you know, the protege of one single conductor yes through my yeah, yeah. Early, mm. early days because you know it then it, be, it becomes more challenging to find your voice i felt by by having those different influences and very different ones i i was in a situation where i could explore what my voice my personal voice would be so it's time to find out how, how your personal voice affected the seattle symphony orchestra because <laughs> Um, you were there eight years as a uh, music director and um, you are now conductor emeritus with that orchestra. Uh, a big thing, your, I mean, your first big job, um, as you said, you first went there uh, uh, in 2010, I think you said, and guessed it. Um, how, was the, how was that? Was that uh, an instant fall in love affair between the, the, the orchestra and yourself? Um, and what, what were the highlights and the things that you were so, uh, you're very pleased about over your time in Seattle? Oh dear, that's <laughs> that's that's material for a podcast in itself. You know? I'm sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I I wouldn't say it was it was love at first sight, but mm. it was very it was very comfortable. Uh, my first week with the Seattle Symphony as a guest was actually in a in a chamber orchestra set, setting. So I remember we played Haydn Symphony and uh, 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 Prokofiev Classical Symphony and. Uh, Martin Obo concerto with their principal Obo at the time, so it was actually ideal to be introduced to the orchestra with that with that format because I was that's where I was most at ease at the mom, at the time. You know, with smaller mm. groups, I would feel much more at home making chamber music with them. So I suspect it it was it was maybe more uh, uh, convincing. Uh, maybe they were more convinced that that I was even aware because very soon afterwards, it was this uh, volcano in Iceland. Do you remember that? Oh thing? yes, don't ask me to remember <laughs> what it's called or even pronounce it, but yeah, I, I remember it, yes. <laughs> and then I was, I remember I was guest conducting in Copenhagen. I was stranded in, in Copenhagen during that time. It was a, a very nice place to be stranded at with, uh, hmm. with my young daughters at the time. We would go to Tivoli every day, but that's another thing. Yeah. <laughs> but. Uh, but but then uh, I remember them really being keen on reinviting me, and I was supposed to go back to Seattle that very same week mm. that the the Icelandic volcano happened, and we kept you know hoping that I would be able to take the next flight and go, and I was supposed to be conducting Beethoven Fifth and Duty Cello Concerto, and um, I don't remember what else, but a, a very very rich program with the whole orchestra. Mm. And and I I could see that this week will not happen, and I, it was frustrating because of course by the time by that time, I was made aware that they were looking for a music director. Yes. And um, yeah. and and I you know I fell in love with the hall, and I fell in love with what I had seen in the uh, of the city and the people there. So, I was hoping, 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 and finally I managed to get on that flight on a Thursday morning. You know, arriving. Right, right in Seattle for one rehearsal and and a concert that same day. Mm. With having, having, I mean, you can imagine the jet lag, not sleeping for three <laughs> yeah. days, waiting to be on the on the next flight all the time. And then I, of course, we had to rework the program because the soloist couldn't make it. So it became a, a Beethoven fifth, and then a Tchaikovsky, a Francesca da Rimini, and Verdi, Forza del Destino overture. Mm. And I remember the orchestra, the union, you know, the orchestra committee agreeing every day to change the pattern of the week, of the rehearsals, of the performances, to allow this to happen. Yes. And what I, so I, I landed, we had one rehearsal and then concerts, and that was with the adrenaline and the appetite we had for making music that day. It be, that, that was the falling in love yeah. uh, story because it became so strong. We, we shared very strong emotions. Then, then I had a chance to spend more time in town talking to 
to the, 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 the board members and the family of, of the Seattle Symphony um, players. So, so we started talking about long, longer plans and that, that actually materialized quite quickly then that I would be the next music director. I'm intrigued to know, um, again, it's a subject that hasn't come up before, or, we, or I've not gone into it in much detail. You've said that you knew by then that they were looking for a music director. And I've been in these situations as well, where you think, well, I'm going to this place and they're looking for a music director. Um, how does that impact on, on your preparations? How did it impact on your thought processes? Uh, it's very very easy to say well you know I, I just tried to be myself and, and just do things normally but um was there any impact uh, you know how did you approach it i find it very interesting well it shouldn't have any, any impact really no like, it shouldn't i mean it, no i mean it shouldn't, I, I, but, but i i agree i agree yeah. with you i agree mm. with you that you know you you go and you you try to be the best of yourself and create the yeah. best env environment that you can you know so that everybody can give the best of themselves that's mm -hmm. that's our job really yes but when it when that thing is in the back of your head because your agent or whoever made you aware of it mm. it creates that that extra uh, anxiety yes I think, it does which yeah. which actually gets in the way I, th yeah. I think it would be best not to know so. yeah, I, I'm with you on this <laughs> I agree completely um yeah and I think I, I now I, I now could put that aside much more easily than twenty uh, what fifteen or ten years ago. Mm. I think that at the at the time with my youth and uh, uh, lack of experience, I suspect those were things that would affect me uh, quite dramatically. Mm. But you know, I mean, once you start the downbeat, of course, all of that goes away. Yeah, it's more the right. it's more the setup of it. You know, uh, mm. you're thinking about it more, and then the fact that every question that people ask you you feel that it's part of the process of an auditioning process mm. you know it makes it a little bit more nerve-wracking obviously mm. no it's true um and there are elements of it that you've just touched on there that every single time you talk to anybody that the answer may well you know be important to that somebody that yeah you know, it's the same as being on trial for a job within an orchestra which i i, I did for about half of my time in the cbso i was on trial for a job further up the section and you know, even though you're officially on trial this week and not on trial the next week, every time anybody speaks to you, you think, "Well, I better watch what I say because it might impact on exactly. my job." Yeah, it's it's uh, it it does play mental games with you, which is why I asked, and you've given such a, an honest and, and brilliant answer. Yeah, it's it's funny because I, as you know, then you you start to to create that first sound on your violin, or you give that downbeat, and then that's that's what makes music so special, and how we know that we are, we're loving it so much is that. Yeah the whole world disappears, you know, and exactly, it becomes yeah. something yeah. different. Yeah. yeah, all of those things disappear. Um, so while you're in Seattle, and you're, as I said, you were there eight years, uh, you also do uh, two years in Brussels with, is it pronounced La Monet? Um, the opera. Yes, La Monet. Yeah, two years as media director there. Um, so again, that's a lot of travelling between Seattle and Brussels and also guest conducting. So what was the two years in the Opera House like? Um, and obviously, because opera takes such a much longer time to build before the first performance, um, was that easy juggling between being music director in Seattle and then music director in Brussels at the same time? Yeah, it was very difficult. Um, I mean, it was three years actually. I, okay. I did uh, I did six production in in Brussels and many concerts. Just enough to realize that each time I was I was arriving in in La Monnaie to do my work in La Monnaie, I was exhausted, mm. and. Um, and that's not the way you want to be leading an organization, you know. And I felt those years were very challenging because it was my first, my first two positions, really. And mm. they were quite prestigious for me. Um, and I wanted to give 200%, obviously, to, to, to each house and the travel and the load of repertoire. But also beyond that, I think the, the work that, that is involved with being a music director in America is mm -hmm. is i mean music becomes 30 percent of what you do right to mm -hmm. in order to be able to make the music you want to happen on stage you have to do so many other things that every time i would 
come and start a production in, in La Monet, I was drained. And, uh, you know, I, it was it was a fabulous time because I had incredible support from uh, a very strong intendant, you know, uh, Peter de Calloway, who was still there at La Monet. Um, and it was incredible privilege to be able to explore this repertoire with incredible voices and um, the, 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 the productions, as you know, in La Monet are always first new, new, new production. So you have an actual six to eight weeks rehearsal process. It mm. was incredible, but exhausting. And uh, mm. I still have fond memories about what I've done there. I, we did a beautiful Peleas and Melisande. We did a beautiful Janacek uh, Yenufa. I did, a, I did uh, three of the Mozart operas, which you know I had never done before in my life. Don Giovanni, Cosi, and uh, uh, Clemenza. Um, so it, it's been an incredible informative time I, w- I wish I had been able to actually devote more of my personal time to invest into La- my, my music making at La Monet because I felt it was really exhausting to be able to, to, to be, to be um, influential in those two different jobs. And uh, it's something I, sh- I think I could challenge easily today. But, you know, as a young man, taking those responsibility for the first time was very challenging. And... Uh, but, you know, I learned a lot, which is something that eventually is what we're always seeking when we're yeah. after those uh, opportunities. Well, you take it forward into the rest of your life. And, yeah, it's it's easy to look back in hindsight and think, yeah, I could have done this. But you're looking back at it with an older man's viewpoint. And, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, I think what you what you take from it, what you, you, what you will and, and go forward. But, yeah, I, I, would, I can imagine how tiring that must be. Well, I, I had I had very very young family as well. Ah, oh, well, time, that, so <laughs> that was, well, there you are. <laughs> made it made it challenging on on many yeah. levels, but yeah, uh, yeah, it was, it was it was an incredible opportunity, and and I I'm very thankful for having had the chance to actually be on the, on the, on stage and in the pit, which is I think the best uh, diet for any musicians yeah. to be able to really accompany from. The, from the perspective of, of, of an opera uh, musician, I mean, in the pit, or to be under the spotlight on stage is, I often, you know, I, I really connect to those orchestras that actually do both constantly. Mm. You think of Seattle Symphony is also the orchestra for the Seattle Opera. And I did production there in the pit with my orchestra during my tenure. And that's phenomenal because you find that this is suddenly an orchestra that listen to each other so much. And mm. that's what I did a lot of in La Monet during my time as well. I, I think I put them more onto, onto the stage in the spotlight, which is something that as an opera orchestra, they already had exposure with, you know, with Kazushiono and Papano and in the past. But I felt that I really wanted to create even more opportunities for them to be to be on stage, and uh, so I've I've done also a lot of uh, uh, concerts on stage with the La Monet Orchestra during that time. I think I think that's a brilliant approach, uh, and just on a personal level, you know, I remember when in Birmingham we started doing one stay um, one concert performance of an opera every single season, um, and it probably started well. It started during Sacre Oromo's time, so that's a good time ago, and I think the orchestra became much better accompanists. Uh, and also better at listening to each other through those experiences, through doing an opera, than they would have done through not doing it. And uh, yeah, it's, I think it's important that that those roles are shared. You know, as you say, put an opera orchestra up on the concert platform and vice versa. I think that's wonderful. I couldn't agree more. I think it's a very, very healthy diet to have. Um, my next two questions, you talked about young family, uh, are based in the youth world. The first one is National Youth Orchestra of China, which you've been going to since 2017. What's that like? Are you committed to so many weeks per year doing courses with them? Uh, I'm thinking also about, you know, the discipline of it. What's their orchestral playing um, discipline like? Everything to do with that, because that intrigues me. And I I do a lot of youth orchestra work and I enjoy it. So I wonder, do you enjoy it? And, And what are the differences between maybe France or the US and China in youth orchestra terms? Oh, it's a lot of questions in one. But, I know, um, I know. <laughs> I'll try. I'll, I'll. I'll try to. I'll try to be accurate as, it's, as I can. But it's to try and stop me butting in all the time and asking another question. No. I thought I'll, if I ask three at once, it's easier. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I, th I would say, well, you know, I was one of the founder of the National Youth Orchestra of China in 2017 yeah. because we realized that, I mean, it's maybe the country in the world where most most people actually play music, right? Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and yet there's no program that really was encouraging playing together as orchestra or ensembles or chamber music. As you know, the Chinese conservatories don't really teach that. Uh, um, as part of the curriculum, it's very much based on a solo uh, yes. career. Yeah. It was really developed with, uh, with, with a, a Carnegie Hall and the idea of really taking the uh, National Youth Orchestra of the USA as, as a model mm. to create that National Youth Orchestra of China. I mean, Clive Gillinson was very involved with, with this as we started it as well. And uh, so I, you know, I always wanted to work more with young people. And this is something that I did a lot throughout my conducting life was to lead youth orchestras. Mm. This, this one was particularly important because I felt there was so much work to be done that it could be exhilarating at what the results could be. Mm. And I wasn't wrong in, in we, we meet in the summers only. So it's really during three weeks in the summer, we have a two week residency where we, we work through uh, sectionals, even one-on-one -on -one, you know, instrument uh, lessons where we have coaches coming from all different orchestras in the world, but with, with Chinese language so that they can really exchange with the mm. Chinese students. So you would have the concertmaster from New York Philharmonic and the principal second violin chair coming from Baltimore Symphony and so on and so forth. And they would come and just coach uh, the sectionals and the individual lessons for a week. Then, then I would start rehearsing with the whole group, while the coaches would still be sitting in the orchestra. No coach. And then yeah. we would have, uh, yeah, and then we would have concerts. So typically we would start uh, concerts in China and then go and tour the world, you know, with mm -hmm. with repeating performances. So it's a three-week program. What what I find outstanding to this day with this program is how much change can happen from day one to the last performance yeah yeah it's it's more than you can even imagine uh, i i remember the first session we we had program uh dvorak nine symphony new world and the first two t rehearsal even after a week of sectionals in the first two t i couldn't recognize the piece wow. it was unbelievable yeah. and 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 it comes from a very simple thing is that they were not used to listen to one another no so the playing was brilliant, but they were they were like seconds delay between be, between the different sections of the orchestra. Oh. So I suddenly started realizing what an incredible gift it was to be able to provide this environment for them because they started little by little to listen to one another. Mm. And I mean, beyond their music making, it's it's something they will take into their lives as well. You know, mm. to be able to. To, to really open up and listen and having dialogue is something that is so precious. Uh, the other aspect of youth is that I've read that you're affiliate professor of the University of Washington School of Music. And I'm assuming that's in conducting and I'm assuming that means that you're teaching conducting something you it sounds like you you enjoy because you know of your attitude with working with youth orchestras of all of those people you know you've just said earlier that your whole musical career has been shaped by so many people's advice and watching rehearsals um any of those things stand out when you teach yourself or give master classes how do you go about teaching and, and what's your approach to giving that back to young conductors Teaching is a funny thing because even though I have those uh, titles and responsibilities, I actually also now teach uh, or help teaching the conducting program at Colburn School in Los Angeles oh. with Isapeka Salonen. Um, so even though I have those titles in Seattle, for instance, I, I, I agreed to having a role at the university more in the sense that I wanted to create more partnership between the Seattle Symphony and the School of Music yeah. at the University of Washington during my time there. So it, it is, it is my, my love for teaching, but it's also my 
uh, my desire to really build bridges between the schools of music and the actual professionals in the mm. city that mm. make music. I, I find this always is missing for me. There's a missing link somewhere. And um, so I, I really wanted to bridge that. So I was, I was teaching, conducting a little bit as a chair, meaning I would do mostly master classes and, mm. but I would invite the, the young conductors to my rehearsals at the Seattle Symphony. That was my way of teaching. Mm. My way of teaching was to, to really create that, that platform for them to experience rehearsals, live setting, to be able to exchange with guest conductors or myself, or, or as I said, everything that I benefited from my time in Boston as yeah. an assistant, I, I wanted to recreate for them, yeah. uh, for as many young people as I could create that for. Uh, so in, in that spirit, I'm trying to think of my role as a teacher to be able to really help the young people to, to find their voice indeed, just mm. like I had this chance to do. So my teaching is not so much about saying what I think is right, rather than just ask a lot of questions. Mm. Because we know that it's only by answering those questions, questions yourself and looking for those answers yourself that you will really believe in what you're creating for yourself as, mm. uh, as, a, as a voice and, and therefore your voice becomes stronger if, if you have had to do the work to, to create that voice. And so that's my, that's my approach to teaching, which, which I really enjoy actually. I, I've been more and more involved with teaching at the Aspen Music Festival also during the summer when I'm there. Um, I love teaching because I feel selfishly that I'm learning a lot too. <laughs> it's a, uh, Teaching is like uh, facing the mirror, right? You, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, will, you will not want to say something that you don't believe in or that you haven't thought about really, really thoroughly. Mm. Um, so there's a, a sense of, of responsibility, but, but also I find, I find incredibly important for me to, to be able to listen to the, 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 young, the young artists too, because I think the same way I, I would like them to like some of my ideas, I'm always open to kind of wanting to make their ideas mine, you know, if I believe mm. in, in them. And so teaching is a, is a back and forth, constant back and forth. It's not unlike conducting an orchestra, actually. Yeah, you know, if, true. If you, yeah. If, yeah, if you open your ears, a lot of suggestions come to you and, and it's, it's okay. It's wonderful to embrace those ideas and suggestions and make, make, make them your own. So teaching, teaching for me is a little bit, I see my role as a conductor, as a teacher, in yeah. some degrees. Not not only, but part of what I do is that too, right? So, well, I, it's also it's funny, you know. I do some teaching or some coaching at the conservatory in Birmingham, and the the students I always take to the most are the ones who who are not afraid to ask you a difficult question, or even say, well, what, "Why are you doing it like that?" When have you thought about doing it like this? And it it means that they're they're already awake. They're already forming their own ideas but they're, they're taking on board what you're doing and there's a, there's a round as a discussion it's a two-way street and it and you know yes. often I learn things from them and, and go home and think actually do you know what they've got a point there um and, and and it's yeah I think what you're doing is by giving them the experience of experiencing professionals rehearsing and watching you rehearse um it gives them the chance for them to think hard about how they approach it rather than just say you beat it like this you say this here you you point at this person there um you know that i don't think that's the best way of teaching i think what you've done is 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 really good really good no well and we also we have this advantage that we've we've been doing this for 20 years or so so yeah we can we can also look back and and maybe share with them what what we believe would be important for them not to miss on, you know, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. At, at that stage in their lives. And for instance, learning, learning, more, learning the, the, the repertoire, you know, the earlier in your life, because the more you're going to go come back to it, the more layers you're going to be able to add to those things. Mm -hmm. um, one final question before we get to the 10 questions, I'm keeping you a long time. This is either going to be a, a feature length episode or a double, uh, like a Daniel, oh, yeah. we'll see. Um, 
the, this is a question that everybody gets asked, so uh, you, sh you should be no different. When you come to learn a new score, do you have a method that you use um, and have used for years, or do you approach each piece differently? How do you learn a new score or come back to an old one? And are you somebody who writes in your scores? Do you make markings, or are you one of these wonderful conductors, unlike me, who can assimilate it and leave their scores completely blank? What do you prefer? Huh. Uh, well, I used to write a lot in my schools as a, when I was younger. It, it was like a coloring book, you know, <laughs> and uh, I, I couldn't even see the notes anymore. Almost. And all those scores I've, are not in my library anymore. Okay. It's like, I don't really see the point. Uh, and the, the more it went and the, the, least, the, the less I wrote in my schools, which now, now I write very little. Mm. Um, fundamentally, I write. I'm quite keen on, on the, the length of the phrases, for instance, or yes. sometimes breath, you know, uh, where I would like, I feel that the breath should happen or harmonically. I also like to do a, a thorough harmonic analysis of, of some of the music, not always, mm. but, but yeah, now I, I, I write very, very little in my scores. The studying is interesting because, I mean, I study at the table for sure. I, mm. I go to the piano, for instance, if I really can't hear a chord in my head. Um, I'm, very, I'm very lucky that I feel I have developed a, a very strong inner ear. Um, also having perfect pitch helps me tremendously in that work. Sometimes mm. it gets in the way, as we know, but to actually hear a chord or, or, or to actually be able to sing at the desk, uh, the perfect pitch helps me a lot. I sing a lot out loud because I feel having the connection to some, making some sound is important. I, I, would, I would pick up the violin, as we said earlier, sometimes for a bowing question or, because bowing is really instructing a lot of, of the phrasing, right? I mean, yeah, you, you, start, yeah. you start thinking about where the accentuation of a phrase becomes. It's all those things, you know, but I, I do spend a lot of time uh, at the desk because what I learn at the desk with my inner singing and inner listening, I remember longer than what I would learn on the piano. And of course, I don't learn, I don't learn the new music the same way I learn uh, uh, music I've already conducted, of course. I mean, this, this we know, but I tend with a new, a new score that I've never conducted, I still like to study almost like uh, proofreading it because I like to feel that uh, first of all, I find a lot of mistakes when I do that, or mm -hmm. a lot of question marks appear yes. in my yes. score. It's it's like, oh, why suddenly the, the the those two instruments that I've been doubling for fifteen minutes, why suddenly those three notes are different? You know, <laughs> and so I like to do that work, which is time consuming, but again stays with you for a long time. And I also like to do in opera. Um, that kind of proofreading technique, which is, I would be wanting to be uh, Dorabella for one day, <laughs> only Dorabella for one day, and see how I relate to all the different characters in the opera. Or I would like to be, you know, uh, and so, so I don't necessarily learn a, a score the same way, depending what it is. Luda, it's 10 questions time, and I will start with what sound or noise do you love and what sound or noise do you hate? Well, I mean, noise that I love, obviously, beyond the, the sound of music, because noise of music, and which could be so many different things, right? Mm -hmm. uh, this is the best, the best noise you can think of. Um, I do hesitate between silence, which... Mm -hmm is really something precious for me, especially uh, the night silence, you know, which is as a, a quality that is really unique to, um, to the, the, the noise of the waves, because I've always loved living by the, by the water, by the sea, by the ocean, by whatever, you know, a river, whatever it is, I need, I need that environment. And living in LA, of course, the, the waves have been very important in my life. Mm. And I realized that I was I was taking a little vacation on the on on the on the beach recently, and then I, I just realized that more specifically, I love that 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 
that noise of the waves at the end of the waves on the sand, you know, when there's almost no water left. Mm. It's kind of this uh, almost effervescence. It makes me think of um, of the sound of uh, aspirin into a glass of water. You <laughs> yeah, know? yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I, I tell you why I love this sound so much, because I think there's a lot of that uh, quality in French music. Mm. And I find that this kind of effervescence um, and sound being not quite sound anymore is something that I find very beautiful. Mm. And the sound that you hate? Oh, I think it's easy for me. It's, it's the sirens. Mm. I just, I can't stand this, the noise of sirens because it feels like we're always living in our little dream, right? And those sirens kind of wake you up out of this dream to reality that something bad has happened. Mm. And I'm, I'm always fearful of the accident. And maybe that's since I've become a dad, I don't know if uh, she is uh, back, but I just feel that hearing sirens just makes me freak out. <laughs> And it's, it's quite annoying too, in terms of, you know, just the noise of it. If you had 24 hours free, what would you spend it doing? Oh, no hesitation as well. I, I would be on the boat with, uh, with family and friends. Um, it just combines all the things I love, you know, like uh, swimming, fish, fishing, the water, the lights on the water, meditating. And... Uh, I mean, you lose track of, of, of time when you're on the water, I find mm. that's very unique. So that would be my choice, being on, which I've done many times, actually. This is something I love to do. Who would be a favourite conductor of yesteryear? I find this very hard because there are so many that are so wonderful and so, for so many different repertoire or styles. Or, mm. um, if, I, if I need to narrow it down, I, I would say Pierre Monteux, for sure, because yeah. he was a... It was very inspirational at the start of my... That is, I've always had a soft spot for Kubelik. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I find his performance is very honest. And I like that very much. Uh, Munch, of course, uh, Paré, because of the French heritage and uh, mm -hmm. maybe the, the Boston and the, for Munch, you know, the Boston connection is obvious. But I thought Paré, Paul Paré in, in a... Detroit had this amazing ability to create a sound that was always off the ground, right? There was, mm. so, it was so sparkly and so uh, uh, happy and so wonderful. I, I, I like music that, that has that, that kind of uh, uh, character. Mm. But, but also, I mean, I'm a huge fan of uh, Arnaud when it comes to certain repertoire. Um, yes. Abado, of course, beautiful. Carlos Kleiber. We can't we can't have a list of yesteryear conductors without <laughs> Kleiber, of course. No, no. Um, I mean, Colin Davis. You know, such a poet, mm. such a poet, and someone that was almost more of a painter than a musician to me. You know, I mean, what it what he could create in terms of the colors and the uh, po poetry was just very unique. Mm. And and I must I must add that growing up, you know, uh, in the in the nineties and all I or eighties I should say more is is really the the Bernstein Karian era. Yes. Uh, very important to me because there was this kind of also uh, wonderful thing that I almost find in uh, I love tennis, and I find that that kind of competition between uh, Nadal and Federer, for instance, which is accompanied <laughs> by great is accompanied by great friendship or admiration i should say yes and i i felt there was this time between lenny and and, and karian that had a little bit of that you know it's yeah. and i i just i just admired many of their initiatives i mean lenny for everything he did for music really as an educator as a teacher as a such an incredible uh infectious man you know when it came to to, to invite you into the music and mm. uh, something that it was very unique also. Brilliant. Well, this, it always leads on to the next very difficult question. And who would be a favorite current conductor? Oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't like that one. I no, I know. I, Daniel okay. Harding didn't like it. Lots of people don't like it. I mean, you know, it, it can be repertoire specific. It can be, you know, whatever. Sure. I understand. I, you know, I'll only be fair if, if 
I include my mentors because they've been so incredible and they're still around. I mean, Ozawa, even even though they are not conducting as much as they used to, but Ozawa, Levine, and Haiting have been very, very important to me. Yeah. And I, so I would I would need to put them in here because they are, they remain very important to me. Yeah. Um, what Simon Rattle has done for the music world is not unlike what what Bernstein has done in his time. You know, broadening our genre, our, our music field to so so much. You know, and mm-hmm. I mean the incredible wealth of his music performance. Uh, of course, performances is his skill of embracing all different styles and genres. Uh, is very is very uh, stunning, yeah. So I think Simon has been a, a big influence um, on me, if not directly. You know, he has mm. he has been very influential. What is the hardest work you have ever conducted? Well, actually, that's an easy one for me to answer because technical challenges I not really worried about because uh, it might take more time. But ultimately, you master it. Yeah, yes, I mean. Yeah somewhat i don't i don't feel that this is something that i would lose sleep over really mm. um my answer would be beethoven's sixth symphony mm. pastoral and brahms second symphony and a little bit for the same reasons actually is that it's everything about this music works if if it's not about the notes you know Mm. I find this music extremely difficult. I mean, all all classical repertoire, really, all Brahms, all Beethoven, all Haydn, all Mozart is difficult um, because you have more questions than answers, really, ultimately. But mm. I find that also on a technical, the the slow movement of the pastoral, for instance, or the first movement of Brahms' second symphony, has this thing everything is happening in between the bits you know and yeah as yeah. I, I think it's the most difficult world to create is to mm. is to really in, influence inspire and and shape what can be created in that space that you're not controlling anymore you know mm. um it's challenging because it, it 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 requires a very special relationship with an orchestra to be able to really kind of be able to create that satisfyingly. And I, I find this really great. Um, you're breaking up there, but I'll say this anyway, just in case it comes through. Um, somebody I think we both know, Simon Webb, who is the uh, chief executive of the BBC Philharmonic in Manchester, once said to me, he said, of all the Beethoven symphonies, he'd seen more conductors make a big mess of that than any of the others put together. He said he thought it was the hardest, and a lot yeah. of conductors don't like conducting it. Um, and uh, you know, I I tend to agree with him. I I find it difficult as well. It's but it's almost you've just got to let it go. And and as you said, it's not about the notes. It's just letting it flow and letting it be. And yeah, it's a tough one. Yeah, and harmonically, you know, I mean, that last movement is going nowhere. You know, it's one mm-hmm. chord for, <laughs> and uh, so just to create that, and uh, it's actually the one I do the most often because even though I find it the most difficult. Well, I want to give myself more and more chances at it. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, what a good good thing. Um, Next question. Uh, And to remind you, you're not allowed to say passport, phone, baton or score. When traveling abroad to conduct, what item could you not leave home without? I would say... I would say my my reading glasses now. (laughs) (laughs) I love reading. I read a lot. And when on 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 the road alone, you know, you spend so much time on your own, that the book is your best companion often, and uh, and 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 today I would be lost without my my reading glasses. Really, <laughs> yeah, it's amazing how many times I've taken my book to for a dinner for one uh, <laughs> when you're on your own guest conducting. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm not quite there yet, but uh, my arms are starting to not be quite long enough to to hold the book <laughs> far enough away. So yes, maybe it's time I got some reading glasses. Um, next. What is the one thing you would change about being a conductor? Well, I, I guess a lot of people have have mentioned traveling. You know, where it's a, uh, I would change that if I could. If I could be the next minute to the next destination, I would. I would really thoroughly enjoy that. Uh, and maybe not being away from home so so much is what I would change. Hmm. In 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 a more philosoph- philosophical way, and that's 
I don't want to ex expand too much on this in, in that format, but maybe I would love to at least explore some changes in the relationship that conductor and, and orchestra musicians can have, mm. meaning maybe that it wouldn't be so difficult to, to have a, a honest feedback or conversation or dialogue about things without feeling the pressure of the hierarchy or the, the you know, the, the business and the job. Uh, feeling a little bit le less like a boss when it comes to the relationship that, you know, of course, one has to be, be responsible for making big decisions and that I understand. But, but sometimes I find that I would, I would like to feel more of a, of, 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 a, of part of the orchestra in, in, in some sense into, into some conversations, planning and, um, and things like that. But it's a, it's a tricky one, but I, I think sometimes it's missing. It's a tricky question, but it's a brilliant answer because I think there are times as conductors you have to be a boss, but most of the time you just want to be another musician sitting in a room full of musicians talking about music. Uh, and that's an equal work. You know, that should be an equal conversation. Um, but because of the nature of being a conductor and all of the things that traditionally and over the years have been lumped on top of that role, um, some people feel that it's not an even, you know, place for you to have a discussion. And sometimes we just want to chat about it, don't we, as conductors? We just want to chat to somebody in the strings and say, you know, what do you think? Um, and yeah, and it's difficult, isn't it? Yes, it is. What profession other than your own would you like to attempt? Yeah, well, architecture, for sure. Um, I love everything architecture. So uh, no hesitation there, especially those days where one can be so uh, curious about, uh, you know, engaging with environment and sustainability. And there's so much research to be done in those uh, territory. Uh, architect, no hesitation. I would be architect. Well, in episode one, I gave exactly the same answer. So I'm, I'm oh, really? with you on that. Yeah. <laughs> and finally, if the world were to end tonight, what would be your choice of final meal and drink? Well, that's an easy one too. I mean, you mentioned my wife, so uh, she would, you know, she was born in Casablanca, Morocco. So it would have to be a Moroccan meal. It would be a, a you know, some. She's a, a great cook and um, start with mete, you know, and maybe a, a fish tagine mm. or um, or or a nice uh, couscous with lamb, you know, or something like that. It could be different things, but uh, Moroccan pastries at the end, you know. I mean, it's very typical flavorsome Mor Moroccan meal would, would have to be. And um, I love fish, so uh, any fish would work in that instance. Uh, then, then drinks, uh, well, it would need to be a, a glass of champagne somewhere because mm -hmm. I love champagne uh, since I was too young to drink it. <laughs> I love <laughs> champagne. <laughs> uh, and then, you know, I'm a, I'm a chevalier from the Burgundy wine, uh, Tastevin. So it would have to be a, a very nice white burgundy to go with uh, with the fish tagine, I think. Mm. Well, that sounds lovely. And I have to say, what an absolute pleasure it's been for the last 90 minutes to chat to you, um, find out all sorts of things, wonderful topics we've covered. And when it, this is all over, I hope we can sit down over a, a nice glass of, that sounds lovely, that wine, a nice glass of that wine and, and uh, get together. Thank you, Ludo. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, it's been a pleasure, Mike. And uh, I look forward for that glass of wine as well. A Mike on the Podium was devised and produced by Michael Seal with music by Ben Dawson. Next time, I chat to a young British conductor who I've known since he was a tuba player in the CBSO Youth Orchestra. His career since winning the Nestle and Salzburg Young Conductors Award in 2013 has been highly successful and truly international. Closer to home, he's the principal guest conductor of the BBC Philharmonic. Until then, bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs>